Hi, my name is Gerdy Verwoerd and you're listening to Daring Self Leadership and the Nature Connection. Gary Pratt has always had a passion for archaeology, a passion that had him spend a lot of time in the outdoors. Early on though, he realized that despite having a BA in archaeology, having a successful career in that field would be challenging even in the very best of times. So he stepped onto a very different trail and embarked on a career in publishing and advertising. It didn't take him long to heed the call of entrepreneurship and start his first business, Steamer Trading. The company, with its unique blend of stylish cookware and houseware as displayed in fantastic resale spaces, was a winning combination. Gary ran it through its initial phase from independent to multiple retailer, and it became a national chain in the UK and is now part of the Pro Cook Group. Entrepreneurship must be running in his veins because over the course of time he started multiple other businesses or played an important role in ones he didn't start. Most notably among all of these businesses was Teach It, which he founded together with his wife. Started as a way to share teaching resources with others and encourage colleagues to do the same, Teach It grew and was one of the leaders and key innovators in online UK education and an early innovator of monetized user-generated content. Once again he moved on, ultimately landing as an entrepreneur in residence at the University of Bath and on his current endeavors, walking leaders and outside, and is currently researching and writing a book for Bloomsbury Business which he hopes might bring all of this together somehow. Gary describes himself as follows, I'm an entrepreneur, business mentor and qualified group walking leader. Walking has always been a key part of my life, whether a simple dog walk, the work commute, or preparing for important meetings. Outside is where I clear my head, gain perspective, and do my best thinking. I truly believe the best decisions are made with the clarity of mind that comes from a mix of exercises, wildness and engaging with others, and during my time as a business mentor and advisor, I have found that clients value the opportunity to refocus in the outdoor world. Gaining perspective is a key part of developing creativity and is more likely to develop when you take a break from the ordinary. You won't find your competitive edge at the bottom of an Excel spreadsheet, however large you project it. So let's dive in to my conversation with Gary Pratt. Gary, welcome to the podcast. Wow, um, very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you know, I've... I think we connected on LinkedIn and I'm always intrigued when people have the outdoors as their um, banner. I always go in and uh, I'm like, okay, what is this all about? And are they actually about being outdoors? And you are. So yeah, I'm very happy that you're here. Hopefully that was sort of conscious. I think the picture changed quite a long time ago. And then I hate the little strap lines where you say what you are. So I, I don't know, maybe it's, Nine months a year where I changed that to just going outside and meeting people. <laughs> Forget all the business stuff. And <laughs> Well, that, that is true. It is basically what you do. So, you know, it does cover um, what it is that you're doing. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, or what yeah. I'd want to be spending all the time doing. It doesn't always happen. This is true. This is, this is probably true. Having said that, and um, Having done this introduction of you where, you know, you have been an entrepreneur for a long time, you've worked in that space for a long time, but you have a base in archaeology. Now, this is a podcast about self-leadership and about the nature connection. So I thought I'd just start off with the following question. Um, When you finished your degree in archaeology, you then went ahead and didn't go for a career in archaeology, but decided to walk a path that could be construed as a path that somebody else sort of planned for you, you know, the more traditional path. Yes. How did self-leadership play a role in that process for you? Uh, and perhaps first say, what is self-leadership for you? What is self-leadership? Yeah, that's a good question. You didn't prime me for that one. Uh... Deliberately, I might add. <laughs> Um, yes, that is a good question. Um, I guess it's just having agency in, in what you do with your life and, and how you navigate it to bring in some nice outdoor metaphors and words, um, which I, 
you know, serendipity plays a part and circumstances always play a part, but you've always got agency throughout that, haven't you? So, yeah, you, you know, you know, one argument would be that I didn't go into archaeology because I needed money and hence <laughs> <laughs> business, you know, was the way to earn money, which mm. is, um, you know, seems like a, a I, I'm sure I did have a choice at the time and maybe I, I wasn't fi- following what should have been my self-leadership at the time. I was following a, um, you know, the, the, the path that was, you know, the obvious path of need money, go and get a job that pays money yeah. um, as opposed to thinking about it broader. But, you know, over time, I think my self-leadership has become stronger. Yeah. Um, for sure. Um, so how does that, how can you tell your leadership has become stronger, your self-leadership? Oh, yes. More good questions. Um, I try. Yeah. I, you know, I'm like stalling now. You'll have to click your clicker. Um, <laughs> I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm comfortable with, with pauses on this podcast. I don't know if it's sort of been a journey of a slow journey. I, uh, you know, having taken that route, mm-hmm. you know, and that was a moment in time, but I, in retrospect at the time, it didn't seem like a big deal. It was like, oh, you know, archaeology will be there. I'll go back to it or something. And I have. Um, I would say my journey into self leadership probably was the realization about 28 that I really didn't like, you know, working for other people in the corporate life. <laughs> So that was my big moment of agency is is giving up a very highly paid job to go out on my own, which is, I guess, a, in every entrepreneur's or a lot of entrepreneur's journeys mm. is to say, I'm going to give all of that up and take a big risk. Yeah. Okay, that was still in business, mm-hmm. um, but it was a, a definitely a, a moment of self-leadership of, right, I'm going to do it on my own yeah. um, for sure. So that probably came later. Mm-hmm. So uh, as a bit of a brick wall of... I don't like this all flying around and doing business and wearing suits. I'm not going to do it anymore. Yeah. Um, and see where that journey took me, um, mm. which was part of also, also part of the journey towards the outdoors. Cause I started like lots of people with travel, which is always a good way to reset your mind and, and decelerate and think differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. Mm. Well, and when you left that corporate life or that employeeship, let's call it, like, mm. let's call it that you, I don't know if you've discovered, but you started your own business. And it seems when I look at your profile on LinkedIn, for example, your resume, you have a knack for entrepreneurship. It's almost like you have it running through your veins. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't see on LinkedIn, you don't see all the failures, do you? But <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> well, a knack is maybe still, the wrong word. Some, still, yeah. you know, it's not so there. It must be something to it because you didn't give up on it. You, no, you have think, every now and again played roles in other people's companies, but you've it seems from your profile that you've always had something going on that was yours. Yes, and I think even in those other roles with other people, they've inspired me as entrepreneurs themselves, mm-hmm. which is what draws me. And I think they're always entrepreneurial journeys, whether I'm not the leader or not in the traditional sense. Mm-hmm. So that's run through that. Um was I always entrepreneur? Was it always there? Maybe I'd, I'd have said I was always creative, you know, in yeah. its broadest sense. And um, third child, quite a lot younger than my brother and sister, so a lot of time on my own as a child. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> inventing, drawing, going outside, playing. So maybe that is part of that mm. self-discovery of. Yeah, I, 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 lots of people in my world of you know incubation acceleration I work in now you know, always talk about risk and entrepreneurship and I'm mm-hmm. I don't really like the word mm-hmm. because you know I don't think most entrepreneurs think they're taking risks they're just doing something interesting and it might be risky to the outside world but yeah probably um, so maybe that was always there for me mm-hmm. um, I think I probably always thought I would you know if you asked my 21 year old self I'd have probably known that at some point I'd quite like to do something for my on my own or not on my own but for myself yeah. I think it was it was always there somewhere mm. but the the you know you know some for some people I guess the the stir to do it is something they're doing they have a good idea they see it in what they're doing for some people it's um yeah serendipity who they meet and for me it was that 
more the push of I don't like this. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. And then you did very different things. I don't want to go through all of them, mm. but if I look at the first one you did, which was, um, of course, now I can't think of the name, uh, the, the, the cooking. Steamer Trading Cookshops, yes. Yeah, I really yeah. like that name. So at first I was like, is this about, you know, trading? <laughs> uh, but it wasn't. And, and then you, and, and you, in between you did teach it, which is very different from, um, the steamer trading. And now you're do- doing walking leadership and you're yes. an entrepreneur uh, in residence. Yes. Um, at the university. So there's still this entrepreneurship thing going on, but there was, so, you almost have to be creative to do, to have such a diverse portfolio. Yeah. And I think there's an intellectual challenge in all of them, which is in, always interesting. So yeah. the, the shops were a bit of serendipity of meeting my business partner and deciding to do it at a moment of, um, let's do it. And, um, well, there's lots of baggage in there about what was happening in the UK economy. And, mm-hmm. um, we had, Cooking was big. We had famous chefs on the telly, so it was a you know it was a zeitgeist mm. moment as well. So, but we did do something really interesting and and grew quite quickly, which was fun. Mm. Um, what it really taught me was don't do retail, but um, <laughs> it's really hard, really hard. <laughs> but actually, teach it was probably the 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 stronger entrepreneurial story, I think, and, mm. and that was in classic vein. Me and my wife on a, a Thai beach. She was an English teacher and not really ever built as a business was, well, you know, let's stick all this on the web. And this is, you know, this is the wild west of the internet in 1999. So, um, and actually uh, the, the, you know, almost a a flipped story where, you know, my wife did build a website and put lots of free stuff on the web, which now seems obvious, doesn't it? You know, everything's free and available. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, it was the market which drove us really, because you know, within a year we had, you know, I'm not going to remember the numbers, but the, the classic part of our teacher story was our our internet hosting company. So we didn't make any money at this stage; it was purely mm-hmm. a free thing. The internet hosting company asked us to leave because we were using up all their bandwidth, which seems so weird today. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it was a moment of mm. should we turn this into a business, and then that's really the entrepreneur where you know we had to design a business, and we did mm-hmm. lots of things which are, you know, I'm not saying we invented them, but we were very early into SaaS platforms, um, doing SaaS as a model, doing mm-hmm. user-generated content, building communities, the stuff that everyone does now. But yeah, you know, five years before Facebook, mm-hmm. I'm not trying to compare. It was a small, small, successful business, uh, but it was entrepreneurial in the sense of we had to invent new ways of doing things mm. with given what was presented in front of us yeah um and i think that's where the for me that's the the entrepreneurial bit isn't being good at spreadsheets or it's creative problem solving yeah mm. and, and if you enjoy that you'll probably be quite good at <laughs> the entrepreneurial yeah. bit could be yeah so uh, what i really like is that you guys had this idea on a thai beach somewhere yeah. in in nature you know and that is a nice jump into that area Yes. So what role has nature played in your life, but also in your entrepreneurial journey? Yes. So it's been interesting to reflect on it. So I'm, as you know, I'm not, not, I'm not plugging my book. It's not out yet, but I'm writing a book about. Wait, plug away. <laughs> for Bloomsbury Business on um, called Outside Thinking, which is around the use of outdoors as a, um, I guess, a canvas for creative thinking and innovation. So I'm having to think about it a lot, both in, reading lots around that and talking to founders and people who use the outdoors so um that's great but it's also made me reflect mm-hmm. and um yeah at the time i probably didn't feel lucky a very modest upbringing and our only holidays were being dragged off to the wilds of the uk camping so never got on an airplane till i was you know a grown up and um never went abroad or maybe one school trip um across to france mm-hmm. so you know, at the time, my friends were probably, or some people I knew were going to Spain on holidays. I was very jealous. But, um, you know, I, it obviously deeply embedded the English countryside. And mm. my parents would never give, take us camping to the popular spot in Cornwall. It would be to some field in Mid Wales. So, <laughs> so I did spend my childhood, you know, 
you know, in, in streams, catching sticklebacks, climbing mountains, mm-hmm. you know, getting muddy. So probably right in my blood from my very early days, there's a picture of me about age four with my, my dad's rucksack and a walking stick when I've just um, climbed um, uh, my first mountain in England mm. in the Peak District mm. um, called Kinder Scout. And um, <laughs> I don't remember it at all, but it was sort of went down in my family folklore as because I was only four and I didn't, you know, I walked all the way and came back down again. So uh, maybe, maybe it was just always there. Mm-hmm. Um, so from that point of view, it always did stay as a, just a thing I did. And I, the change probably to your point about entrepreneurship mm. is at times of stress, hardship, problem solving, I would take myself off for a walk and it was just what I did. Mm. And so it was just there that that was something the way I, I knew my brain worked. So yeah. whether that was just popping out for a walk with the dog or taking myself self off to Wales for a day and walking alone, you know, so it's always been there, but I guess I never until now mm-hmm. started to meet people like you, meet other practitioners, talk about it, think about it, have to research it. I was like, oh, you know, that actually is quite a powerful. There's a lot of, research behind this that says why it works and um so i guess that's was a part of my entrepreneurial journey yes in retrospect at the time i probably didn't think i probably thought it was just the way i relaxed mm. yeah yeah so did you i just listened to an interview with you on the international risk podcast, podcast? exactly yes. and you guys were one of the things you said is that um you advise anybody to go outside for you know for a 10 minute walk or something before entering in, into a meeting yes or you know you've got a problem that you have to got have to think through don't try and think through it behind your desk go outside for a walk did you run into any um raised eyebrows well as you would be like okay you guys i have to solve something i'm going off now i'll see you in a bit um not so much at in my business, um, I actually, the, when I really put it into practice, so I had a little foray after, so I went back to archaeology and did a master's mm-hmm. when I sold my, um, when we sold Teach It. And I loved that. I loved a bit of academia. And I actually ended up being a teaching fellow for a while, a research, uh, sorry, a research fellow. And um, that meant giving lectures and going to conferences and really putting myself out of my comfort zone. You know, I was happy standing up in front of, hundred people at a business conference and spouting about how great teach it was, mm-hmm. but you know, the pressure of academic peer review, uh, <laughs> it was terrifying. So I put myself into it, um, quickly learned, you know, I'm probably not made out to be an academic, but so that mm. was good, good to learn. Yeah. But, um, I consciously, when I was going to deliver a talk at a conference like that, that's when I sort of started to properly put into practice. So in the, one in was in Edinburgh, um, so I actually walked, got off the airplane and walked all the way into into Edinburgh, into the conference, sort of straight into my speech, which um, at the time no one knew it, but afterwards when I was talking, you know, that sort of raised some eyebrows of, you know, oh, you didn't sort of arrive last night and sit in your hotel room and tap away or <laughs> look at your notes. <laughs> um, so that that's maybe a little bit of an eyes right, raised eyebrow. But mm-hmm. I do get it when I try and, you know, there's definitely a whole cohort of people who think it's, you know, bunking off when I yeah. try to convince people now that how powerful and you should do it. Mm-hmm. And really that's, if there's one, you know, if there's one call to the whole book, if, you know, I'm not sure people actually read business books, but if you flick to the last page, it, it, what it's trying to do is legitimize that. Mm-hmm. Really, it's trying to make people think that it's, that's actually is proper deep work. It's not. It's not bunking it's not off. Scared at all, is it? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no it's, it, and it's like, you know, I used when back in corporate, I used to work in a building that, ha- you know, you know, those buildings where they have all the lifts and, um, and wet spaces like toilets and stuff like in the center of the building and offices around it. So I would sometimes just go for a walk around the block, I would call it. Yes. Now, it would be even better if I could do it outside. But, you know, every now and again, my colleagues would see me just walk around the block and do it again and do it again. Yeah. So, yeah. That just, for me, it was the moving part. Yeah. And it helps when it's even better. I didn't think of taking it outside other than during lunch. Yes. Because that was sort of accepted. I don't, thinking back, 
probably people probably would have been like, what are you going to do? Why are you going outside? You're supposed to be working. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't seem productive. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas when you talk to people and you ask them where they have the best ideas, it's either in the shower or going for a walk or, you know, a bike ride or whatever it is, but not at their desk. You hardly ever hear somebody say, oh, I have great ideas when I sit behind my computer and, uh, you know, and put my thinking cap on. Well, I think you've seen, seen the quote we, me and um, Al, my collaborator, I use often, mm. which is a John le Carre quote of, you know, the desk is a dangerous place from which to view the world. Mm. Yeah. Um, so we we try we try and ram that down people's people's throats. <laughs> but you're right. As part of the book, I did a survey of a whole load of um, quite highly funded um, early stage ventures, mm-hmm. and it was just just about you know, where do you do your best thinking? And you had the uh, the outlier that might be sleeping, um, mm-hmm. um, which is quite interesting. And I can't remember who it was. There was. Um, it will come, will come back to me, not not out of this cohort. But they told mm-hmm. me a story about some writer who used to used to nap with a timer that woke them up after five minutes um, because they knew they'd have something important to write down. So, <laughs> wow. so there's there's some um, some people they were outliers. Oh, I reckon eight, oh, I can look up something something like eighty eight percent of the people I asked mm-hmm. always was involved the outdoors. Now I, that could be running, cycling, swimming. Walking, yeah. mm-hmm. but outdoors was key to a lot of them yeah. when they actually drilled down and thought about not i was trying to get them away from just thinking about doing mm. their work just how they sorted problems thought about yeah. stuff thought yeah. clearly mm-hmm. yeah so i think it's well you know this is you know there's plenty of neuroscience and yeah, evolution, evolutionary reasons for that yeah but um we sort of got into these systems which you know doesn't reward it <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. And you know, I'm not one of those people who is very deep into research. It's just I don't store information that way in my head. You know, tell me a good story and I'll be able to remember it. I, I can remember books I read as a kid, but um, a book that I read two weeks ago and was filled with, or I tried to read, to be honest, was filled, was filled with science. I, I get to chapter number three and I'm like, this is not for me. Yeah. So, but still, yes, there is science, there's lots of science out there. And what it does for me, at least, it just confirms what I instinctively know or what I experience when I go outside, Yeah, which is I feel better. Um, I am, I feel healthier. My body is uh, obviously in a bit better shape than when I sit a lot and my brain works better. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what, and that's what the science just confirms. Yeah. Yeah, so. I think absolutely. And well, you can you can read a few bits of my book when it's out, and some of them will be in there. You can you can give up on chapter three then. <laughs> <laughs> now, if there's a good management, uh, um, what do you call that? A management brief at the, at the beginning. You know, like I used to have to write these things, thick reports, and then uh, just a, a white paper, I guess is what yeah. you call it. So yeah, if that's well, in I... there, or put some stories in there, I'll be there. The oh, stories, yeah. Oh, the, the beauty of it not being an academic book, saying I wasn't cut out to be an academic, is, you know, I can get loads of opinion and no peer review required. So, you know, it's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it sounds like a book that I could actually get into. So uh, don't worry. <laughs> so what you do now, one of the things you do now is take leaders out for a walk. And uh, coming back to my own experience, but also from what you've told me and, and, and what I've heard and read, is that when we take people out into nature, whether it's the mountains or some other piece of nature, it doesn't really matter. And we have the opportunity to take them out for more than just one day. Mm. In my experience, the first day is always about, I don't know, the, the things that are happening in life or when you're taking them out for a specific business reason, probably what is happening in their business and you know the, the, the traditional questions. It's when they spend time out longer than that one day that things start to change. So what are the biggest changes that you see in the people that you take out? Mm, well, definitely that resonates strongly with me. And I, and I, you know, sometimes it's a struggle to get people to accept and invest in that time. True. So, you know, when I first started, I made probably the mistake of trying to do too much on the first day. Mm. And I just let them decelerate and 
get stuff out and yeah so i absolutely and day two is okay day three is very good normally Mm -hmm. so i totally agree with that that there's a bit of time um why and what do they get out of it um Yeah, that's really interesting. So from feedback, you know, the day three is when when people feedback on day three is when you get the the words you want as a practitioner, like that was transformational, and I you know I've got totally new new ideas. But trying to unpick why and how that happens is quite hard, isn't it? Mm. Um, well, research even has a hard time doing that. Official research, exactly. So you know, it definitely happens. Why does it happen? Um, in most of my work when I'm multi-day is in teams. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, as you know, you, people do have different conversations side by side, but yeah. I think it's, it's brought into huge focus for a team that work together all the time, much more than maybe just a group of disparate people who've come together. They will have different conversations, but they've mm-hmm. got, they're coming with no baggage, are they? Mm-hmm. Whereas a team comes with a huge amount of, you know, let's call it, history corporate baggage ways mm-hmm. they've communicated structure hierarchy loads of stuff yeah yeah and i think that just all breaks down and and let's say life becomes simpler um, mentally mm-hmm. um and i just think that just does take take time so there's all the science bit about what's happening up here but but i think you know i found that most of the work i do and i i do have to in- I'd have to include quite a lot of, let's call it methodology. Mm-hmm. Partly, I think, because it, it allows the people to sign off on it, but it's a course or a, uh, yeah. <laughs> we're doing. Yeah, there's no accountant <laughs> saying, what was this? It was just yeah. a pleasure trip. It's not mm-hmm. just a holiday. or mm-hmm. and, and I'm very clear that I, it's not team building. I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, rah, rah, you know, going down the river, a rafting yeah. or mm-hmm. you know, those types of things. So a lot of my job, I think, is just facilitating those conversations and nudging them along. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you start to think about why that happens, you know, definitely they have those different conversations. You see them transform over that time. There's lots in there probably, isn't there? There's a shared experience, but uh, and it sounds cheesy, doesn't it? But the, the boundarylessness of the outdoors mm-hmm. and actually the fractal nature of what you're looking at, the yeah. colors, the um, your own your body sometimes the 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 ones who feedback probably most positively is when they've had a maybe a harder experience whether it's been tougher than they thought Mm -hmm. or it's peed down with rain for an entire day you know funnily enough you know i I find that can be quite powerful to people you think they're going to just be annoyed at that day Mm -hmm. um but maybe that's just getting your brain into that state where you know things become simpler whether you're consciously thinking about it or not so whether that's your communications with your colleagues whether it's um you know a problem you've been thinking about life mm-hmm. life becomes life becomes simpler when you put that backpack on and it does doesn't it walk out yeah <laughs> and i don't know about you but what i find by now my body is so used to carrying a backpack that it actually sort of automatically slows down um, and I also notice that is something that people who aren't used to it find challenging, the slowing down part. Yes. Yeah. And um, I'm sure you do this. There's, um, well, again, not going in, in, there's plenty of science on this one, sort of mm-hmm. tempo, tempo, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I find myself having to brief people that there's, this isn't peak bagging or, you know, <laughs> or racing. I took mm-hmm. one group, I took one group out, which I've, taking out again in a couple of weeks so they're sort of serial now they've got it mm-hmm. but um they are um a very high performing group in in sense of uh um you know an, an ex almost olympic swimmer and rugby player and um crossfit runner you know so they're, they're right. super fit guys yeah 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 um and i and competition de- driven yeah definitely they need that first day to get the banter and <laughs> rushing out of their systems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but you do have to manage it because I think, yeah, there's a, there is a bit of that expectation of, you know, there's a challenge to be, yeah, know, to that... be achieved. And it is challenging, as you know, but mm, that's not why you're, not why you're doing it. No, it is challenging, but it's not, it's not, 
a challenge in the sense of we want to know who comes up to the I don't know to the summit first. Yeah, it's more it's challenging in the sense that you're doing something that you're not used to doing. Yes, and also um, I take the I bring people into the mountains where there's you know you you start low and you have to go up high and. I oftentimes have to remind, tell, just simply tell people, well, you, you can go at that pace. But I know that if I go on that at that pace and I have to do it for the next, I don't know, four or five days, I'm not going to be ma- able to make it to day five. You know, I'd yeah. like to be able to, I don't mind coming to, in my case, Mountain Inns and be tired at the end of the day. I, I quite like that, but I'd like to be fresh in the morning. And if I keep going at the, your pace, yes. I don't think I'll be fresh in the morning anymore. Yeah, you know that kind of thing. It's I found I always compare it to city pace. People have a city pace, which is the pace they have, you know, in regular life, I guess. Yes. And then they come to nature, and especially when there's a lot of altitude, a lot of ascending and descending going on. I sometimes just let them experience that it's a challenge to go at city pace in that kind of an environment. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. I I started doing. I call it forest dipping because it, you know, mm-hmm. it's not forest bathing, but you know, trying to start walks with a bit of quiet contemplation and a deep wood. Can't mm-hmm. yeah, obviously, got to pick your route carefully to make sure you've got a bit of deep wood. Yeah, um, but it does tend to reset people quite quickly. I think so. There are yeah. some things you can do, but it, yeah, I, I I'd absolutely struggle with the same thing of of you know, that side. But also, you know, you, I'm sure you found this as well. Is it's surprised me how few how many people aren't that confident going out into the yeah outdoors Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. i think when it's been part of your life and natural to you it's it's just yeah that's not scary is it it's (laughs) for me it wasn't it wasn't part of my life for a long time i grew up with a parent or with parents who'd love to go outside and you know took us on walks and stuff like that um but then i started to work and I had this block of years almost say certainly two decades where I didn't really spend time outside and didn't really didn't even notice or realize that I was missing it yeah it's just when I started doing it again it felt like a homecoming hmm. I always say that uh, we have bodies that are meant for moving that especially are meant for walking that's what they were designed for yes and um, now I'm not saying that everybody who goes in, out into nature and starts walking will experience a homecoming there's people who will never experience that kind of homecoming and may experience it someplace else but that's what it felt like to me and that's why i moved that's why i eventually said okay i you know corporate life indoor life is not for me i don't i need to spend out time outside and preferably as much as possible Mm. and what i I am a bit biased or I it's not a um a, a true uh, I'm not I can't use the average you know person as an example because the people that come to me or or you know that book a trek or something those are people who want to walk in the mountains anyways yes but it's those people who've never done it before and then start walking and ha- you know do 5 or 7 days that ha- I've had people who were moved to tears by the experience they were having, you know, not I'm just not the surprised. walking, but also the vastness, the magnificence um, of the natural surroundings they were in. Yeah, well, you're doing it somewhere with vastness and magnificence, yes, which is helpful, I'm very isn't lucky it? in that respect. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, but you could, yeah, we do get on sports. So, well, you've know Al Kennedy, um, who yeah, I, I do. collaborate mm-hmm. with. You know, it's one mm-hmm. of the reasons we started our just our networking was mm. you know, because it's a very easy way for people to try it. It's you know, it's half an hour from home, half a day, sometimes yeah. a bit longer. But you know, that's exactly the idea. Is you know, just take the first step, and you know, and enough people get it from that to then yeah. want to do more, to want to try something more. And that's um, how you start. It's like learning yeah. how to walk or learning how to ride a bike. Yeah. I, you know, I, the first couple of times that I went out by myself, I nearly fell off a mountain. I was like, maybe I should learn how to do this properly. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, and, but yes, you're right. Coming back to uh, your point of how many people seem to be 
almost scared of going outside and especially of going outside by themselves. Um, I find that a bit shocking, really, because it's, in my experience, a safer place than the city. Yeah, um, again, there's probably lots packed in there, isn't it? But I, you know, and, and obviously it's harder or, you know, conceptually more risky for some groups of people and, and, and some people, you know, it's not, it's not the easy, most easily inclusive place. Yeah, you know, no, that's true. Some challenging mountains. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for, you know, that close to home nature and walking and, you Absolutely. know, most people can, can do stuff quite close to home. Uh, we had to walk, Al and I, in Bristol in the UK, you know, mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago. And, um, you know, a place called Lee Woods, and it's, it's well known. But, you know, it's this it's deep, dark, wild woods. And but you're a quarter of a mile from the bustle of the city, really, yeah. across, across the river. Mm. So you, know, you can find wild places, if, Absolutely. Not, if not open, magnificent mountains, you no, know, close and- to home. Exactly. And that's not that's not necessarily what I meant. Yeah, it's mountains, of course, are a more challenging mm. landscape than uh, your woods. But you know, like you say, I always tell people you don't have to go far and away to get to nature. You step outside, close the front door, and even if you're in the city and you've only got skyscrapers skyscrapers around you, look up. Yeah. You know, there these days Birds, for example, uh, birds of prey among them have adop- adapted so much to the city that they now live in the city and make their nests in the city. So if you look up, you'll see nature. Yes. That's uh, something I need to work on, Gerdy. I, I, um, I don't know much about nature. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, I, I mentioned I, birds and I, yeah. I can recognize, I, I think, two or three of them. And that's yeah. it. I walk, or you probably have, I've walked with people you know, who know every mushroom they come across. And, oh, yeah, I have. And every bird. Yeah. And I find them hugely impressive, their knowledge of that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, it's building slowly. I know a few mushrooms now. know which ones to avoid yeah. anyway. Yeah. yeah and I, <laughs> I always, you know, people ask me, what kind of flower is that? And I have gotten quite good at whatever is growing here. Uh, but, you know, ask me what mountain we're looking at, and I may accidentally know this one and otherwise i will think of what day is it today and i might actually say well it's the mon mountain or something because you know, it's monday <laughs> <laughs> people don't know you know they don't remember anyways that's when i revert to my archaeology i always have a bit of that that knowledge somewhere in there <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so when you you've been walking for a long time and you've taken leaders out so what is it that you have taken away from those what lessons have you taken away from those experiences? Yeah, well, that's interesting. Um, I think it is back to that communication. You know, I've been a managing director, or probably would be a CEO now, but mm-hmm. you know, if not, that uh, titles matter much. And um, you know, I'd hope I was a good one. Uh, <laughs> but having worked with lots of others, I think. What I take away, and then back to your point about how they change in that time, mm-hmm. or how the communication changes, is you know, it sounds sort of weak, but I don't think it is. Is that you know they they absolutely become more empathetic, more collaborative, mm-hmm. more open to other people's ideas than. And I'm not saying inherently those people aren't in their corporate lives, but I think again the machinery of corporate life. Yeah puts you in a meeting room with 40 minutes to cut reach a solution and mm-hmm. i think it's very easy for leaders to come with a big a big lump of confirmation bias into that meeting mm-hmm. with almost knowing what they want to happen at the end of it yeah um and, and i'm being very broad here but there's no. nuances we are yeah. beyond that and i think what i take away is you know the leaders absolutely view their teams differently and communicate them differently at the end of it so mm. um and it shows itself in loads of ways. It shows well in the you know even just their the way they you know are asking their open questions on day three to their staff, or, or you often reflect with them, and they found out twenty things they never knew about their staff, whether that's yeah. you know work based, home based, whatever it is. So mm-hmm. um, hopefully, it makes them more yeah compassionate, empathetic leaders, but on, on a more I guess methodological level, and I'm not. It's very soft the method type stuff we do, but you know, I, I hope it instills in them a you know 
just ways to think about their business. We we tend to talk about even seasons, seasonality of business, mm-hmm. and you're using all those natural metaphors. You know, mm-hmm. Al and I do one where we make we ask them to gather things and model their business using natural items of you know mm-hmm. fer, ferns and and to be honest, it, it, it's you know it's the type of thing I think in a again in a meeting room you go oh, that's a stupid thing we're doing, yeah. but suddenly in the outdoors it's a fun thing you're doing and mm-hmm. something always comes out of it. So. Um, I don't know if that directly answers it, but um, yeah. So for me, learning from them is, you know, if I was a, you know, maybe I, if I was a leader again in that sense, a leader of people in a business, I would try, you know, whether I use the outdoors or not, and I've mm-hmm. had, I, I would, but I think I'd at least structure the way that conversations about challenges, innovation were different to maybe the ways a lot of people have done it for 20 years. And to be totally frank, I think young people are approaching it. When I say younger people out, I think their world is very different to mine was. Mm. (laughs) They're not quite, they never quite got stuck in the hamster wheel, but maybe people of my generation did. Mm. Yeah, Um, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't unpicked why that is. But (laughs) Well, you know, they're not where we are yet. So who knows what might happen in in between. Exactly. Um, But you mentioned something that, reminded me of the word mirroring how um, nature can ab- absolutely mirror what is happening in our lives or in our business is that something that you have to make people aware of or is it something that people can also have almost from an experience that people almost can have on their own a bit of both, I think. I think we not say a lot of what we do. I do is nudging people mm-hmm. along. Um, you know, a part of it is the slowing down and forcing the slowdown. That isn't necessarily partly in making sure they're you know not you know killing themselves trying to do something so they can't think. Mm-hmm. But you know, just picking the right sort of wow moments, view spots, places to stop and have lunch, to be quiet. You know, I think those do have profound effects on people as well. Um, and maybe when people sometimes take themselves off, well, maybe I'm not <laughs> going to sound terrible. I'm not a fan of cyclists because <laughs> <laughs> they rush through nature. You yeah, know? they do. And yeah. and I think there's, you know, I'm sure there's lots of benefits to, you know, probably beasting up a hill on a bicycle and down again. And mm-hmm. the wind in your hair, again, I like skiing, you know, like mm-hmm. the wind in my hair. Um, well, well, conceptually, I wear a helmet now for safety. Yeah. But um, but I, I think they, they don't take in what's around them when you're rushing too much. So it's maybe back to your tempo. But I definitely for encourage and build into plenty of times just to stop, be quiet, reflect, look at what's around you. And I think yeah. that can, it does have a profound effect on people. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And it's, I think it's learning to notice stuff again that you would otherwise miss, which is one of the most, I found, one of the most important things that, or the, the biggest benefit, I guess, of moving on foot mm. is, like you say, when you're on a bicycle, well, at least when I'm on a bicycle going up, I don't know, notice anything except for my front wheel. I, I yeah. don't have the energy to look anywhere else. Yes. And uh, going down, I'm just scared. So, you know, <laughs> it was way too fast on that on that thing. So I can't do anything but look in the meter in front of me and hope that I don't hit anything that will send me flying. Yes. Um, but, yeah. With something else you said, you mentioned the word leader, and we and you know it's in your uh, business name. Mm. Um, what I have found when I take a group in the mountains, into the mountains, or into nature with me, and especially when that it's a group of people that knows each other, people who are the designated leaders back in the valley may not necessarily be coming out as leaders when they s- step into nature. Yeah. yeah that's well, interesting. And, and, and I think, you know, you have, you take groups of, ma- of people into nature that have actually chosen to go into nature. So that, and that same goes for me. Mm. 
but you also mentioned earlier the the um what do we call it the rah rah thingy the oh the the team training stuff mm. where you cannot actually often see this happen you know those people that are called managers are not necessarily the leaders in those environments yes what do you see happen when it comes to leadership within the group when you bring people into nature yeah um i think you see some of some of the same but i try to take away all of the leadership <laughs> <laughs> uh, to the extent that they know they're coming out with me and i know the route but but you know i i generally don't tell people the route they have a rough length of time roughly how hard it's going to be mm -hmm. and quite often the route changes anyway and we free wheel and decide to do something else so the best you know, i think that's mm -hmm. quite interesting to take away any leadership from a group mm. so there is no no one is required to lead mm -hmm. um so that's always interesting i think so yeah. you're, to your team building point you're sort of taking it away but someone's got to step forward mm. yeah this in the most of the work i do no one has to step forward no so what is how can they show their leadership and i mm -hmm. think that's back to you know they're showing a different side of their leadership then i think which isn't the follow me leadership it's the you know it's the leadership through you know maybe the ideas they have or they put forward or even how they re respond to ideas or questions other people have or reflections mm -hmm. so yeah maybe it's that side of leadership which comes out in the outdoors more than the you know the traditional leadership and, and that could come from anyone i guess in that group yeah you know yeah. you might find that you know you know, I don't have many quiet retiring people that come, but you know, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, maybe that person, uh, you know, is in an environment in the outdoors where they feel either more open, mm -hmm. more valuable to put their opinion forward. Yeah, which is maybe harder in other environments. Mm. Yeah, um, yes, yeah, I recognise that. And what I've also seen, but more so in. Um, I guess more in family structures because I sometimes, you know, I sometimes I'm just a guide and uh, people come as families or are, as a family, they are part of a larger group. Um, that those that you, you can tell what kind of, let's put it like this. You can tell what kind of leader they are by how they behave within the group, especially when people are having a difficult time getting up a mountain, for example. Yeah. Where are they in the group, in, in that in that company? You know, are they all the way up front and want to be um, at the summit as soon as possible, or somewhere in the middle, or somewhere behind, and just encouraging leading from behind, almost. You know, just making yeah. sure that everybody comes up the mountain. Which I always find that whole process I find incredibly interesting, just to sort of observe. Yes, what's happening yeah. there? Yes, I need to do more observing. Mm. <laughs> it's all. It's all. It's all in flux and learning, isn't it? For yeah. us, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. which I, I love too. Mm. I want to be conscious of our time together. Um, I always ask people three questions when it comes to um, to nature, and I hope you had some time to think about it. This, I think, I prepared you for this one. I, I sucker punched you with the first one. <laughs> um, I always ask people, "What is a favorite book of yours that celebrates nature?" Well, yes, lots probably, as you always get, I suspect. You did mm -hmm. send me the challenge, so I get extra points if it's a novel. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you a novel because I really enjoyed it. Um, it's called The Eight Mountains by Paolo Cognetti. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've ever heard of it. No. So it's, uh, it is a novel. There's a bit of probably semi-autobiographical in it about mm -hmm. a you know, city boy, country boy in the Italian Alps. Mm -hmm. growing up and it stretches over 30 years but the backdrop's always the Italian Alps mm. um, I think partly I like it because of, of that backdrop but partly because I don't really know the Italian Alps at all so it's just one of those books I read and went oh, I really want to go there mm. um, I spent some time there this summer actually in the so Italian that's, Alps. that's my novel that's the, uh, my novel all recommendation right. and, mm -hmm. um, and you probably have you know there's lots it's about 
for me and probably most people, it's it's not necessarily the books about nature. It's about you know, it's about the writer's ability to convey the natural world, isn't it? So yeah. um, I think I looked at I can't remember the name of the person who was on last week who, who selected the where the crawdags sing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which just conveys a natural environment beautifully, doesn't it? Yeah. Regardless of what's going on in the book. So exactly. So there's quite a few that come under that. Um, yeah, so that's my novel. Mm-hmm. What is a favourite piece of music? Oh, again, I had a I had a couple. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> impressive because I... lots of people are like, "Oh, this is so difficult." Well, one is uh, I, I quite like a bit of country music, mm-hmm. and um, it's a country band I like called Chatham County Line, and they have uh, a song called "Country Boy, City Boy." Okay. Um, back to our. I wasn't sure if I was going to select that one when we spoke, but you mm-hmm. know, after our conversation of you know your journey from the city to the country um it's a very simple beautiful song but it's yeah, yeah it's about the different viewpoints of a city and a country boy both wanting to be each other that's so cool <laughs> yeah, and recognizable as well you know for as a kid i always wanted to, we didn't live in the countryside but yeah I, had, i sort of had a longing to do that what's a favorite movie of yours that celebrates nature um This is probably back to that, you know, slightly so low childhood of mm-hmm. of um, lazy Sunday afternoon telly. So I watched a lot of westerns. Uh-huh. So um, probably any John Ford, but let's say The Searchers. So any big country, you know, you know. You are the first person to mention a western, and you're talking to a huge John Wayne fan. <laughs> So the so, search you know, is a really good choice. Big country, Utah, mm, you know. Yeah, and John Ford, I think, I think, you know. Yeah, as yeah. a child, you know, those were, back to the point of, you know, only holidaying in damp Wales, you know. Mm. These were a- alien landscapes of beauty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But so vast that, um, you know, as a anyone who comes from the UK, you don't really get big country. Well, you know, I come from uh, the Netherlands. You've got more big country than we had, I yeah. promise you. <laughs> Yeah. So there you go. There's my three. I like it. Good Lord, the searchers. People are always like, who's John Wayne and why are you a fan of him? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love a Western. Yeah. yeah. Especially especially the, the ones with great cinematography like that. That's what it's about. Mm. doesn't really matter again what the story is. The story is <laughs> always the same, basically. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, they changed the color of the hats, but they might as well still have a white hat and a black hat for the yes. good and the bad guy. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I've got a final question for you, and this is going to be an easy one. What is one thing that you can recommend listeners do if they want to go outside more and, you know, for the benefit of nature, but also to connect with nature? Uh, so I've answered this question before on talking to Fee McMillan, actually. Mm, yeah. So she, I think she she jumped it on me. But um, <laughs> oh. my advice was sort of, it was in, it was during COVID, but I think it still stands. And something mm. I've done is, you know, whether it's your garden or your, or a walk, and I do encourage people to actually go where other people are, not purposely, but into the, is do it barefoot. Mm-hmm. If you want, a, you want an instant connection to nature, go for a barefoot walk. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and even if you just go outside and step into your garden on the grass. Yeah. 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 I think yeah. you get you instantly get some connection, regardless of whether it's warm, dry grass or sloppy wet grass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Frosty grass. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this came about because I, I I had some back problems and I solved them by going barefoot running as opposed to wearing trainers. Wow. <laughs> so it's just the shape of my feet, I think. They have to be mm. nice and flat. Mm. Okay. Um, well, Gary, thank you. I enjoyed it. And uh, I'll put all the links of things you've mentioned, but also to uh, where people can find you uh, on the website. And uh, let me know when your book comes out because I'll promote it for you. No thank problem. you very much. No Actually, you've finished writing it yet. So there's a way to go yet, but um, we'll get there. Okay. And um, hopefully, I'll see you in the Alps one day. I hope so too. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Take care, Gary. You've been listening to Daring Self Leadership and the Nature Connection. You can find the show notes for this episode and every other one on the podcast page on the Dare Greatly Coaching website. The podcast is available wherever you like to listen and it's hosted by me, Gerdy Verwoerd. 
The music is Butt Bursting by Poddington Bear. Thank you for being with me today. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode. And in the meantime, as always, go there greatly.